Okay. So foot and ankle. Um, this is my favorite part of the body. Um, I remember having an anatomy instructor, uh, one of my colleagues here on campus said, oh, her favorite part of the body was the kidney. And I said, you have a favorite body part? She's like, yeah. And I was, yes, what's yours? And I said, I don't know. And then it took me a day and I realized that this foot, the foot is probably my favorite uh, uh, aspect. And I think of the movie, Mr. Deeds with Adam Sandler. I like a feet, right? And um, it's so much of it is important for our, our human function. And um, it actually is a, it's a marvelous structure. It's, it's meant to be a, a mobile adapter so it can absorb uh, stress and it can uh, conform to the uneven environments that it, that it hit, hits, right? It's not always a nice stable surface. And within seconds, sometimes milliseconds, it's got to go from a, a nice loose mobile adapter to conform to the surface to a rigid lever to push off for propulsion. And so much of what our lifestyle that we do, we screw up the foot by putting in a, in, in shoe wear. And we, we think about, we're going to explore these arches here, these arches we need to, um, to support. And um, we restrict the motion, we restrict this movement. In fact, I, I don't know if I have it, I'll, I'll make sure I have it there, but I have some supplementary um, information on like barefoot and shoe aspect. It's beyond the scope of this particular class. But um, if you're interested in it and just understanding how miraculously and how marvelously designed the foot is and how we really get in the way by, by footwear and the, you know, as we'll talk today, we'll go through some of the, um, the mechanics and the joints and some of the mo motion. And then we'll, we'll do on Friday as I'll show you some of the foot function and the relationship between the arch of the foot and all the way up the kinetic chain and how much influence that has. And we have talked many times how the, so many things are interrelated and uh, the foot is the primary starting point for looking at that foundation. <clears throat> so when we look at the, when we look at the, the foot itself, it's uh, the ankle is, we're really looking at a couple joints. There's only one, uh, one joint in the ankle is one plane of motion and that's the, the tail cruel joint. And the talus is the top of the bone of the foot. And the cruel, the crux, is formed by the lateral malleoli of the fibula and the medial malleoli of the tibia. And it kind of forms like this. If this is my talus, my fist is the talus, the uh, crux or the, um, the is my thumb is the lateral malleoli and this is the medial, they come down and they form like a, 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 a joint there. And it's a trough that that fits in there and that's how the ankle moves. And that's where your dorsiflexion and plantar flexion come in is right here at this uh, aspect. Now you have a distal tibula fibula joint, and you can see the little connective tissue there. It's holding the tibia to the fibula. And you have a, a proximal tib fib joint, and you can see the connective tissue there. And uh, typically when you have ankle sprains, it's gonna be on this side here, but you have what's called high ankle sprains. You can have it higher up on the chain, and you can have some dysfunction here at this tib fib joint. This up here, even though it's so close to the knee, doesn't really affect knee function too much. But this mobility of the, uh, of the fibula here, especially at this proximal joint, can have some downstream influences in ankle motion, particularly the amount of ankle dorsiflexion that you have. And so you'll see a lot of, um, in, especially in physical therapy, particularly in orthopedic and outpatient, you'll see a lot of manipulation or mobilization of, a, of the proximal tib-fib joint. So whenever you see that tibula, fibula, tib-fib joint, there's a proximal and there's a distal this gets all the attention, this distal joint here for the um, for their ankle mobility, but uh, you can't have movement here without appropriate movement there as well. Let me open up my uh, screen marking tool as well. So although the tibia is significantly larger than the fibula, um, they both play equal roles in ankle stability. Uh, most of the contact surface is on the tibia. So the loading is through the tibia, through there. Uh, the fibula, I, I, different reports, different books, 5%, uh, 10% of the loading, but it's not really a load bearing um, to, uh, bone. It's I mean, most of the load is going through the, through the tibia. But a tibia, a tibia and a fibula fracture are common in like car accidents and injuries. Um, that's probably where you'll see a lot of the trauma. If you see any kind of bone fractures, you'll see like a tibia fracture or a fibula fracture. Sometimes they have to put hardware in, sometimes they don't. A lot of times you'll have, particularly the fibula, because it's, it's so thin, they don't really do a lot of casting or surgery. But if this, if the fibula fractures, let me see how I'm going to do this. 
with the fibula fractures, um, what they'll do sometimes is it, it might fracture. And since it's connected, it, since it's really held in place a lot by the musculature and this interosseous membrane, um, what they'll do is they'll, they'll just have you go non-weight bearing for six to eight weeks. And what's happening is since the, the, the fibula is kind of like this, what they don't want to have happen if it's, it fractures and not displaced, they'll, they'll, let it, they'll let it heal. But what can happen with loading is that you can start to shift out and you start to get the separation. So those are the, sometimes what happens with these, uh, with the lower extremity here with the tibula and the fibula. Um, so you can see here, this is the talus. If this is your uh, superior looking down on top of the foot, and this is the surface that uh, articulates with the tibia. And then you have the, uh, the, uh, the lateral malleoli here from the tibia or the fibula, and then you have the medial malleoli there from the tibia. And so it kind of comes down and, and it, sinks in on either side of those. Um, when you look at the foot, you can kind of see how it's divided into tarsals, metatarsals, and phalanges. And you saw that with the hand, it had the same thing. You had your carpals instead of your tarsals. You had your metatarsals instead of your metacarpals. And then you had your phalange, the same aspect. Uh, in my video uh, that I have, let's see if this book does it yet. Yeah. Uh, that same type of division where you have your, you have this division of the foot where you have a hind foot or a rear foot, you have your midfoot, and then you have your forefoot. And this is really uh, important to understand from a functional division, because when your foot's on the ground in closed chain or when it's in open chain, you're going to have different interactions between the forefoot and the rear foot. And uh, just as a disclosure, we're just kind of putting out there in open chain, when the, how the rear foot moves, the forefoot follows. So if you do inversion of the rear foot, you're going to have the exact same aspect of the forefoot. Um, the move, the muscles that control this, there's these are functional divisions, but there's no, I, I think it's very hard for someone to, to do this actively to move their rear foot and forefoot independently, right? Um, it can happen passively, but not actively. And what I mean by that is that when your foot's on the ground now and you go through uh, some kind of pronation, supination, inversion, eversion, the rear foot and the forefoot are doing opposite things. And uh, we'll demonstrate a lot of this on Friday when we look at, um, uh, when we look at the foot, and we see how we look at like subtalar inversion, eversion, and in open chain, because there's no there's no force of the ground reaction force there, what the rear foot does, the forefoot just follows no problem. And the muscles that pull on here are coming through here and pulling that as well. And when I evert the foot, the whole foot's turning out as well. But if I have the if I if I'm on the ground and I go through uh, rear foot eversion, the foot can't follow because it's hitting the ground. So we'll we'll show some stuff like that uh, on Friday. But this division here is associated with the same thing here. You have your tarsals and you, you have your, really you have two big tarsal bones. You have your, uh, you have your um, calcaneus, which is your heel, and you have your talus, which is on top there. And then you have the second joint, the second largest joint below the knee is the sub tailor joint. And that's the joint that's just below or sub of the, um, the talus. So then you have the calcaneus, which makes up your heel. And uh, where's my star? And right here is where your Achilles tendon attaches. And so that's where your gastroc and soleus, uh, that tissue is continuous down around the heel and it becomes your plantar fascia here. And so it generates this kind of sling system through the foot and your Achilles, your big gastroc muscles and your Achilles tendon, largest tendon of the body comes down through here, continuous with the plantar fascia. And it's your plantar fascia from this view here that pulls on that forefoot and kind of creates this arch, kind of like a bowstring for your uh, your rear foot. And that's why it's hard to kind of separate or actively control the rear foot separate from the forefoot, but it is involved in that loading and shock absorption. So you have your subtalar joint here uh, that kind of makes up that between that talus and the calcaneus. This is your heel, that's your calcaneus. And those are just two bones of the, um, of the uh, of the tarsals, and then you have these uh, cuneiforms, cuboid, and navicular. So you have these five other uh, bones that make up the midfoot. And when you look at now, like this articulation with that articulation, this with that, that with that, all these articulation, I think there's um, oh I got to look at the number, but there's at least thirty or forty articulations just in the foot alone. And so there's quite a bit of interaction and relationship that's happening here. And unlike the hand, the hand is more for like fine motor and control. 
The foot is more for adaptation and loading, right? Shock absorption, because we're load bearing through the foot. And so it's able to dis dissipate those forces. And depending upon the foot mechanics, when this foot hits the ground, you have all of your body weight coming down into the earth. And so you have the earth pushing back against you. Um, under normal uh, uh, circumstances, all of these articulations should be absorbing 95 to 97% of those forces and dissipating them. And the rest are, are absorbed through the gastroc, through the uh, uh, distal knee, and very little of the forces should be transferred up the chain. It's only when we do like abnormal gait patterns or movement that we start get those forces transferred up through the IT band in the lower back. And we have those repetitive stress injuries that are very common in runners. So here are your ankle motions. You have um, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Now keep in mind that this is happening at the tail curl joint, so the ankle itself, and you it's only got one uh, plane of motion. It's one degree of freedom. So you get your dorsiflexion, your, you get your ankle dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, and it's happening right here at this tail curl joint, right between the, the, um, the talus and the tibia fibula aspect. When you look now at these other motions that you have, you have supination and you have ab and abduction. This is where, I think I had mentioned it a couple uh, lectures ago, where this concept of pronation and supination happen within the, within the lower extremity. You know, we talk about pronation, supination as wrist position, but pronation and supination is also talking about this, this triplanar motion that exists within the joint. And you get this supination and uh, pronation or inversion, eversion, which is nothing more than subtalar joint motion. So the subtalar joint has this motion in the frontal plane where it can kind of tilt so if these are if my hands represent my feet, if I do inversion, that means the dorsal part or the uh, the plantar surface of my foot are are facing in. That's that's ankle inversion or foot inversion, and then I have eversion, which the bottom of the feet are turning out. Just keep in mind that when we talk about the ankle, we're not talking about this joint right here. The ankle can only do dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. It only has sagittal plane motion. The subtalar joint is where the inversion and eversion is happening. So it's another degree of freedom, and that's in the frontal plane. Have an abduction at the foot. So it joint. And in fact, this mid tarsal joint right here through the arch, it is the one that has the multiple degrees of freedom. This is this is what has the most mobility. So this is where you're getting inversion, eversion and you're getting dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, and you're getting some adduction and abduction. But single degree of freedom here at the uh, ankle joint, a uh, single degree of freedom right below that at the subtalar joint, and then two degrees of freedom through the midfoot. And then they have these combined motion from that. Um, I'm gonna switch over to the Newman textbook because it shows it much better in terms of these uh, planes of motion. Yeah, see, so you can see here uh, from this view, the, mid, the rear foot, midfoot, and forefoot. This is the transverse tarsal joint, and this makes up that mid tarsal joint. Right here, you can see the subtalar joint, and then right here is the tail cruel joint or the ankle, right? So you're getting your dorsiflexion, plantar flexion here, you're getting your in inversion, eversion here, and then here you're getting a combination of dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, and inversion and eversion. Uh, I wanna show those axes of rotation and that movement. Yep. Better image. Uh, real quick here, that's the mortise type joint. That's how, how that kind of comes down and clamps down on either side of the talus. The, that's, that's that really tight um, uh, function or uh, fitting that you see there for the dorsiflexion plantar flexion. Maybe it's not going to show me the uh, axis of rotation. Oh, here we go. Okay. Okay. The ankle. And again, I have this in the in the video, but I think it's better to kind of show it is that uh, it's interesting is that the dorsiflexion plantar flexion is not 100% purely in the sagittal plane as you're actually, you actually tilt out a little bit. So when you do dorsiflexion, when you bring your toes off the gas pedal, you're actually not coming straight back. You're kind of coming back and out a little bit. And when you go plantar flexion, like you stand up on your toes, you actually go down and in a little bit. So you're not quite here. You're more at an angle going down and in, up and out, down and in, up and out. And you can see that it just has a slight single degree of digit uh, off the axis of rotation. You can kind of see how the toes come up and out here. This is the right foot and then down and in. So there's your dorsiflexion, your plantar flexion. Um, you got your convex. So the, the talus is the convex surface and the, uh, the tibia is the concave surface. 
And so when you go into dorsiflexion, you're rolling and sliding in opposite directions, and then you're ro rolling and gliding in the same directions depending upon closed chain or open chain. Um, we had talked about this already with the dorsiflexion, that dorsiflexion isn't always just seeing the ankle, the toes moving closer to the shin, but you're going to see this a lot in functional movement when the foot's flat on the ground and your, your knee's traveling forward. So this is the ankle dorsiflexion, and so is this. This is also ankle dorsiflexion. So when you squat, when you squat and you're doing this movement where the knee's bending forward, right, and your heel's staying on the ground, part of squatting is ankle dorsiflexion, and that's plantar flexion as you come back, right? But I want to show the sub. Here we go. So then now you have the sub tailor joint. And you can see the axis of rotation there, and you can see that it's at like almost a 45 degree angle, and it's also off center, so you're kind of coming up and out as well. And this is where you're doing um, inversion and eversion uh, of the of the of the foot, right? It still is only one axis, but it's going through two planes of motion, so that when you subtailor, when you do that subtailor uh, eversion, so the here's my right foot, and uh, I'm turning the foot out. Um, not only am I going out a little bit, but I'm turning my foot out into abduction, right? So the toes are kind of going out a little bit. And then when I'm doing inversion, I'm turning the foot in and I'm doing a little bit of adduction. So where the rear foot goes, the forefoot is following. So it's just a coupled motion through that. But it's really only one axis of rotation, but it covers two planes. So that's why you're getting like that inversion, eversion. Uh, and again, I, we're going to show this on uh, Friday when I have the skeleton down and we kind of look and see what's uh, what's happening there. This understanding these planes of motion, these axis of rotation is, is the most challenging thing when it, when it comes to the foot. Once you have this down, everything else comes really easy. Um, you know, it, it also uses interesting terms like adduction and abduction. You know, we think of adduction and abduction as this. But really, when it comes to the foot, ab and abduction mean more like internal rotation, external rotation, what we traditionally think of that. And uh, in the video, I kind of talk about how the nomenclature changes a little bit. And the, a better way of looking at this is we always look at the foot like this with the, um, with, the, with the foot coming down. Sometimes it's easier to think of the foot as if I were, were fully, like my toes pointed like a ballerina and thinking of movement, ab and abduction in that direction. And that's kind of how this comes to play. Like when we assess hand function, we don't, we assess it like this straight. Um, we don't assess it like this, but if we assess it like this, like ulnar deviation, ulnar deviation, uh, radial deviation, that would look like internal rotation, external rotation. So it's because the foot is like at 90 degrees from the body, but all the analysis is done is if it was theoretically straight through. So just kind of, that helps to with the understanding a little bit. But these images and everything here is fully explained in the uh, in my videos, and I do think your textbook actually has it as well. Uh, let's just go in through and see. So you kind of see how abduction and adduction is more like internal rotation, external rotation. So if you were to internally rotate your tibia um, and with your knee bent at ninety degrees, you would be turning in this way. But this is more you keeping the tibia stable and moving that way. Well, you're really not abducting anything. What's happening is the subtalar joint is turning out, and the and the forefoot's kind of going out a little bit with that. It's just coupled motions. Um, this is showing you your superior tib fib joint and your inferior tib fib joint, uh, and then you look at. Remember, we talked about valgus and varus positions with the knee last week when we were talking about Q angle. Um, you're getting that terminology again now, valgus and ferrous, but it's looking now at the calcaneus and how this is either out or in. And this uh, calcaneal va va uh, valgus, which is the same as eversion of the subtalar joint, or the calcaneus varus, which is the same as inversion of the subtalar joint. So when you're looking behind the foot, you're looking at the um, is it is the bottom is the bottom of the calcaneus pointing in, or is the bottom of the calcaneus pointing out? And in order for me to do this, this motion of me pointing the, the, that in is not happening here at the ankle joint. It's happening below this at the subtalar joint. And so what's happening is if I if I'm in this way, this is inversion, and if I'm if the bottom of the foot's out, that's eversion. And if this is everted, this is creating that calcaneus varus. And if this is inverted, that's causing the cal I'm sorry. Uh, if this is inverted, it's causing the calcaneal varus, right? Because it's creating air between the two ankles. 
and then if it's uh if it's uh doing the external or the e version it's going to be doing the valgus because those ends are coming together sticking together that way remember valgus think of gu gum the, the proximal ends sticking together and varus is air and the proximal ends that have space between them to allow air to kind of go, to go through perfect okay so this this these images are actually better than the um the e See here that the axis for the uh, for the ankle joint for the tail curl joint is not perpendicular to the sagittal plane. That it's it's kind of tilted a little bit at this angle. And so if this was going to come up into dorsiflexion, you can see that the bottom of the foot would actually be turning out a little bit to the left. And when I go down into plantar flexion, it would be pointing down and in towards midline a little bit. You're not going to show me a good one for the sub tailor joint. So here's your uh, sub tailor joint right there, and I you, you saw in the um, in the other um, image about that 45 degree angle that's coming in. So all of this uh, inversion eversion, so taking the bottom of the foot and turning it in, and the bottom foot turning it out, that is not coming from the ankle, from the tail curl joint. That's coming from this sub tailor joint, and because of the way that the forefoot right here's your here's your rear foot and there's your forefoot, and what happens is when I go into eversion, the foot, the toes kind of turn out a little bit, which if I looked from a top-down view would look like, I'm sorry, did I say inversion? If I do eversion, the, the toes would come out a little bit and, and look like that external rotation or that abduction of the forefoot. And when I do inversion, because of that angle, the heel is going in, but it's bringing the forefoot with it, and it's kind of bringing it in a little bit into adduction, or which would be how we'd look if the foot was flat, internal rotation. And then as we move down the, the chain, we went from subtalar joint. Now we go to this transverse tarsal joint, or sometimes called the mid-tarsal joint. And it's the relationship between the two large um, uh, tar uh, talus bones, and it is um, or the tarsal bones, and then it's relate it's relating with these two cuboid and the navicular, and then you have your uh, lateral, middle, and medial cuneiform one, two, and three, and then these make up that the, the the keystones of of the arch. And so in this joint, this is actually a mobile joint. It's think of it as a combination of the ankle joint and the subtalar joint. You get you have two degrees of freedom. One degree of freedom mimics the ankle, so you get um, so you can get you get ankle dorsiflexion and plantar flexion here. You can also get um, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion here at this transverse tarsal or mid tarsal joint. Your inversion eversion is not happening here at the ankle joint. It's happening below it here at the subtalar joint, and so you're getting that inversion eversion. You can also get inversion eversion through this mid tarsal joint. So you you have three joints. Uh, you have dorsiflexion plantar flexion here at the tail curl joint. You have inversion eversion here at the subtalar joint, which also creates forefoot abduction adduction. And then at this transverse tarsal or mid tarsal joint, you have both dorsiflexion plantar flexion and eversion inversion. So you have more more degrees of freedom here than you do at these two. But these two combine together you get that full range of motion through those three planes. Does that make sense? So one degree of freedom at the ankle, one degree of freedom at the subtalar, two degrees of freedom here, which kind of completes that, that aspect. And so just as a tangent or a side note, when you're checking for limitations in dorsiflexion, you're gonna get about 20 degrees of ankle dorsiflexion. Um, 10 or 12 are gonna come from the tail curl joint and the rest is gonna come from the mid-tarsal joint. You can have situations where you have limited tail curl joint range of motion and your body is picking it up at the uh, mid-tarsal joint. The more dorsiflexion you have here, the flatter your arch is. And so people that have really flat feet or have plantar fasciitis or uh, have foot dysfunction, um, that might, it's either the cause or the effect, right? The, the chicken or the egg argument but you can have limitations in dorsiflexion and that's what's causing your, your flat feet because of the, the body can't get the ankle range of motion here at the tail curl joint. So it's picking it up here at the mid tarsal joint. 
same thing with foot stability with this like sub Taylor joint. You have the reason why you uh, have your ability to do inversion eversion here is in closed chain. What the forefoot's doing and the rear foot doing are doing opposite. It's being picked up here at this joint here at this transverse tarsal or mid tarsal joint. And then you have your um, metatarsal phalange joints and your just like your fingers where you got your flexion and extension, right? So that's what's happening there. You just your levers are a little longer. Your, your fingers are not as long as or your toes aren't as long as your fingers. And you do have you do have the ability to ab and abduct. Um, the more barefoot you are, and the more sensitive your feet are, the more you can individually control your your uh, toes, just like your fingers. When we're born, we have as much dexterity in our toes as we do in our fingers. The problem, the reason why we lose that dexterity, is because we we don't use our feet as much as we do our we don't use our we don't use it as much, right? And then we put our our feet in shoes, and we have nice stable surfaces that we use, and um, the toes become like one functional mass and you start getting crowding and over and then you get like hammer toes and you get a whole bunch of crazy shit on your feet because of all the weird stuff that we do. And then you have podiatrists that come along and they say, oh, you know what, let's just take this out and break it and pin it. You don't need that and pin that and pin that and let's cut that out. And, and oh, look, now our feet look perfect, but now they can't move because there's no mobility anymore. So yeah, podiatrists are interesting. Okay, so this is a toe mode. You can get toe flexion, you can get toe extension, and then uh, you can get ab and abduction. And uh, I'll go off on another little tangent here. This thing's called like toe stretchers, and these are remnants of uh, yeah, like well, that's kind of a weird thing there, that foot gym. But they have these things that you can put in between your toes to kind of help space, and it's kind of a pod pod uh, podiatry type thing but to kind of help with the alignment of the toes and to eventually build up that ability to, um, here, that ability to be able to go through that abduction and adduction and start stop with that crowding, right? When you look at your feet, like if you look at your hand, you put your hand out in front of you, you can see that it forms like a V, right? You can see that line here that this is coming down and you can see this line here coming down and right here it will make the V. When you look at your foot, it should be the same thing. You should see this here. You should see a line here coming up and you should see a line there coming up and it makes like that V. What most people in the United States or in uh, uh, industrial countries is they kind of have this, this diamond shape where it kind of comes up and then comes in and that's the point. And then you start getting uh, loading over the, um, the first metatarsal here. And then you start to get, instead of pushing off on the big toe uh, and the big toe is taking the force like it would be there, the force is starting to go there. And then that just further enhance a downwards spiral of a toe moving in and this tissue getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you have this big ass bunion here and then they cut that off and then they break the toe and pin it, but it never changed the mechanical relationship of why you were rolling on the inside of your foot in the first place, right? So then you end up with like knee problems and ankle problems and, and so on and so forth. So that's joint mechanics. I know it, we went through it pretty quick, right? That was like 17 minutes. 20 minutes and uh, qu quite a bit, but there's three main joints and uh, you're dealing with all three planes of motion. They're just kind of doing it um, in different, like because of the different axes of rotation, like the nine degree axis of rotation of the tail curl joint, 24 degree axis of rotation of the subtalar joint, and then that mid tarsal joint. The specifics you don't have to know. The only reason why I know it is because I just saw it, but if you were to ask me like a week, uh, two days ago, 20 minutes ago, I wouldn't have been able to tell you those angles, but just appreciate that it is off tilt a little bit and your foot's mostly moving up and out or down and in, up and out, down. And, in. and there's consistency amongst all three axes of rotation. So you, all of them are your foot's going up and out, down and in. And even if you look down at your feet and you kind of do plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, if you try to bring your toes up as high as you can, you'll notice that your feet kind of come out a little bit. They just don't come straight up. They come out and out. And when you point your toes, they kind of point in and, and you're kind of going down and in in that movement. Okay, so if we start looking at some of the um, the connective tissue in the lower extremity, um, we'll start down here at the ankle. You have your um, your different tibiotalar and tibionavicular, and these are all ligaments, and they're named accordingly to where they're originating from and where they're attaching. It's kind of like with the hip, the iliofemoral or the ischial femoral aspect. This is looking at the um, medial side, and so here's your tibia on this side, and um, this is referred to as the deltoid ligament because it kind of has these three divisions, one, two, and three. 
And you very rarely have any types of, of sprains here. It's a very strong ligament. So this is this would be you kind of if you let's say you were on ice skates and your 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 skates kind of went out, that would um, mostly result in a bone fracture uh, before the ligament actually uh, damaged. So you very rarely do you get ligament damages of the medial side of the ankle. Um, majority of ankle sprains are on the lateral side when you look here, and that's the relationship of the fibula. That's because we have that down and in relationship, up and out. This the way that the foot goes with the joints, you have a tendency to kind of lay on that side and your foot will kind of roll over. And you know, if, if you here's your ankle, we don't have a lot of mobility here, and it's kind of blocked because you can see that the fibula sticks down a little bit. So you kind of jam there and then it acts like a lever, and that's why a lot of the force is usually you get damages up here at the at the bone. This way, however, we can roll the feet out so much that you can come down so far that that fibula can hit the ground and all the ligament structure there gets uh, gets overstretched and torn and your um, calcaneal fibular uh, ligament and sometimes your anterior talofibular ligament, but this one right here, that's the primary one that's injured in an ankle sprain. And this is a, a low ankle sprain. You can get some higher ankle sprains that happen higher up above uh, in the tibia or fibula, but um, most of the ankle sprains are down here on this side. Have a question at all? Okay. All right, so now we look at the, um, the relationship between the rear foot and the forefoot, and we start looking at these uh, arches that are formed. And you have three arches. You have one medial arch, one lateral arch, and one transverse arch that goes uh, from medial to lateral. And if you look at like a, a front view, like an anterior view, you can see this transverse arch and it basically comes from, it's like a mid, uh, like mid part of the foot and it forms through this, these cuneiforms, first, second, and third cuneiform in that cuboid. And then if you look from a lateral view, you have your um, medial arch and then you have your lateral longitudinal arch. And you don't have one arch, all th these three make the, the, the dome of the foot. And it's better to think of the, of the arch of the foot as more like a dome than to think of it as like a single arch because it's not linear, it's really three-dimensional. And this arch aspect is, the, uh, is kept in place by this plantar fascia, by this ligament here. And as I said, you have, this is continuous, this plantar fascia, this is very dense connective tissue. And it, it, it anchors here at the calcaneus, but the fascial relationship is continuous with the, um, with the Achilles tendon. So you have a fascial line from the from the base of the big of the first toe and all these uh, arches here through the um, uh, through the phalanges right where the anchor is for the medial and the lateral, and it comes straight back. And then in between here, all this space here is filled in with intrinsic musculature. So not only do you have the um, the connective tissue, but you have the intrinsics, and then you have all of these extrinsic muscles that are coming down and around and supporting the arch. So you have a very robust functional and structural um, support mechanism through here. And what's supposed to happen is people always talk about, oh, I have flat feet or I have a high arch. And what's supposed to happen in normal foot function is that you go through periods of pronation where your foot's collapsing to absorb stress, shock absorption. And then it goes into forming the arch to form a rigid lever for propulsion. And it's a handoff back and forth, just like an agonist antagonist relationship or what goes up must come down. Pronation and supination is a normal part of shock absorption through a loading with gravity and then propulsion rigid lever uh, to push off for uh, for mobility. And so pronation and supination is is a normal part of aspect. Now, the question is, is are you how much in pronation are you starting? And even people that have flat feet they're still going through some levels of pronation, supination, and people that have high arches, they're still going through levels of pronation, supination. They're just how much movement, how much mobility, how comfortable is your body doing that? And under normal circumstances, like healthy individuals, you should be what's called subtalar neutral, and you should be able to go through a full cycle of pronation and supination, and you don't have to have arch supports or special footwear for any of that. It's just a normal product of that functioning. And if there's breakdown because of that, it's not because your foot is misformed. It could be maladapted, 
but it's because of the muscular tension that's being created by the intrinsic and extrinsic musculature, right? And why the plantar fascia ends up getting beat up is because the muscles down here are so weak, they can't maintain that arch. And the plantar fascia is just like a, it's a support mechanism, but it's, it's a secondary support mechanism. The primary support mechanism of the entire foot, and, and, and actually for all joints of the body, are the musculature. Uh, like I use the example sometimes, if you're driving around a mountain, you have two ways of keeping your car on the road. You can use the steering wheel or you can use that guardrail, right? That guardrail is there just in case, but it's gonna, you're gonna beat the hell out of your car, the side, the paint, and the... So think of the muscles as the, your steering wheel, the, motor, the neuromuscular control, and then think of the guardrail as your ligaments. They're there, they kind of support each other. The ligaments kind of give you the, uh, the guardrail kind of tells you where you need to be and kind of, and if you do get too far out, it helps. So when you get people that have plantar fascia, it's usually because their foot's jamming down and pronation way too much. And it's because the muscles either intrinsically or extrinsically are, are not doing their job. And so that's why when you rest, it, the plantar fascia tends to get better or they try to have you stretch this out. Really what you're doing is you're breaking up any of the adhesions because of the, the muscles. The muscles in here are just so overworked that they need a chance to recuperate. And then you're, you, well, you know, if you were, if we were in class, we'd be able to do more of this, but um, hopefully you get it in your musculoskeletal, your interventions that you'll have um, like different foot exercises that you can do like short arc exercises. And let's just, let's just do it right now. I hate doing that. I hate saying, oh, in this class, in this class. Oh, cool. They have like this, they have so many freaking gimmicks. It's so crazy. But um, yeah, like you can, and this is actually showing it in the totally wrong way to use it. So, um, so what, one of the exercises you can do to kind of start to support the arch is you want to start building these intrinsic muscles and you want to bring this, these two parts closer together, right? So they kind of create that arch. Well, what ends up happening is you get this over dominance of toe flexion. And so this is not really meant to be the toe flexor that's coming in. You're not supposed to like try to curl it with your toe, what you're trying to do is take this part of the foot and bring it back. So think about doing opposition and repositioning of your hand without doing your thumb, right? And that's kind of what you're doing. You're trying to create that arch here in the foot. So you can see that I can do it there. What you're seeing there is you're seeing this happening. And that's, that's reinforcing an in, uh, inappropriate mechanical aspect. Like you want to have it as the intrinsic of the foot because the toe flexors are usually coming from the extrinsics. So you got, there's a whole host of exercises that you can look at. And if you just do a quick search on like restoring the arch, here, let's do it. I've got a computer right here. And I, I want to give you guys a heads up as you go into your into your professional career. Orthotics are big freaking business, right? Um, podiatrists and chiropractors and therapists can bill out anywhere between three hundred and four hundred and fifty bucks for them, and it costs them like twenty dollars to make. So they're huge profit margin. And I'm not against orthotics. What I'm against is that. I look at orthotics like I do a wheelchair. It should be a temporary thing to help you get up to your functional level. Think about what would happen to the extensors and flexors of your hips and knees if you were in a wheelchair for, for a long time. And that, that's what you use to support your upright posture, right? You become dependent upon it and the muscles are no longer able to do that work. And what the orthotics should do is it should like put the flame out. Let's say your flat is totally arched here. It should kind of help alleviate some of that stress, but it better be coupled with some activities to help start to build that arch so that the muscles can come back online and start to do its job. You can kind of see the plantar fascia here. Um, you can see that it's uh, inflamed, irritated. And what's really happening is the tend this, this, this connective tissue is just in overuse. It's getting stretched out way too much because you're getting too much collapse, too much collapse, too much collapse. And the muscles, the intrinsic muscles of the foot, you can see them here, um, they're not doing their job, right? Because they're they're being overloaded, and so it's a it's a matter of strengthening those exercises. So let's look at uh, uh, intrinsic.
So this like this is appropriately done. You can see that that shortening of the arch, but it's being done from the base of the first met, not at the toe in the toe flexion. So you're kind of creating these arch type aspects and um, you know, people like you got different types of things of doing different toe exercises, picking up things with your toes. It's basically spending time barefoot and getting your feet accustomed to adapting to the environment. Um, so it's not, I'm not trying to convert you guys all to be hippies and start going outside barefoot all the time, although it do you a hell of a lot of good, but you can start to explore this a little bit with some of these exercises by, you know, kind of moving some, doing some of these movements. And, um, there are, there's a lot more resources now than there were about five or six years ago, but this is becoming more mainstream. Um, some of these postural exercise, these positioning and, uh, you know, these toe exercises to start to build up the intrinsics of the feet and, you know, the core musculature of the trunk and spine, which we're going to talk about next uh, unit, gets all the attention for like back pain and shoulder pain and hip pain. Well, the foot has its own core as well. And it's this whole intrinsic system. And, um, you know, this, this is the, if you want to be an expert in like lower extremity mechanical pain and dysfunction, um, understanding foot mechanics and understanding the importance of the musculature of the feet uh, is so much more important than understanding the appropriate posting and orthotics and and your goal, if you're a really, if you're a really good practitioner, your goal is to have a bin of a, a garbage bag that's full of orthotics because you progressed your patients or clients out of the orthotics because you got the foot to be able to do what it was supposed to do. Just like if someone had back pain or shoulder pain, you're trying to condition the tissue so that they can tolerate the load so there's no longer inflamed or irritated. That's exactly what you should be doing with the, uh, the foot musculature, both intrinsic and the extrinsic muscles. Okay, off tangent, back. Um, so you can kind of see the, uh, these are the tendons of the extrinsic foot muscles. So you have your, um, peroneus longus, you should have your posterior tib coming down here. Your anterior tibialis is going to come down and attach here. These are the extrinsic muscles that are grabbing onto the arch and kind of helping pull it into inversion, eversion, pronation, supination. And you can see then the connective tissue that's here. And then you should see a whole bunch of intrinsic muscles. Uh, we're not going to get, let me see if doesn't get any intrinsic. Okay, fine. A lot of books, what they'll do is because it, it gets so complicated is that they'll just look at the intrinsics like we did with the deep hip rotators as all like the similar aspect, right? Just kind of supporting the arch. Um, but this is gonna, we're, we'll go through the extrinsic musculus here, but it doesn't look like they're going into intrinsic at all. Oh, it does. Okay, good. Perfect. I'm just overlooking it. Okay, so the biggest muscle of the lower extremity is the gastroc. We looked at the gastroc last week when we looked at it as a knee flexor. It's as much of a knee flexor as the hamstrings. Uh, in this case now, it has its distal attachment. It converges. Uh, you have two heads. You have the medial and the lateral heads of the gastroc. And just uh, below this is the, uh, is the soleus. And the soleus... Uh, it all becomes continuous as the, the Achilles tendon. And the tendon, the muscular tendon is junction is quite large. And you, then you have right down here in the Achilles tendon, it's called the, the avascular zone. And uh, let's get a little box here. Right here is where if someone has like an Achilles tendon injury, this is where most of the injuries occurring because it, it doesn't have as much vascular supply. Since um, you, you get up here, you get certain tears and injuries. Where's like up here, the Achilles tendon, you can get strains and it's hard to tell sometimes, is, is it the muscle, is it a muscle pull or is it the, in the tendon? You have quite a bit of circulation here, particularly because you have the soleus that's right next to there. So most of the injuries up here don't really require any kind of surgery. It's when you get way down here at the distal attachment uh, is where you end up needing to go in there and repair that. This is also the tendon that they'll harvest from cadavers when they want to do uh, uh, an ACL repair. So they'll use this connective tissue and instead of harvesting the semitendinosus or the patellar tendon from the other uh, the same knee, they'll use the cadaver uh, aspect. So the Achilles tendon is quite big and it, it's responsible for quite a bit of loading. And as I said, it's continuous with the plantar fascia down below. So here you can see the gastroc uh, cut away and you can see the soleus and you can see the soleus has um, most of the gastroc fibers ended kind of mid-calf. You can see the soleus comes way down here and it has more of its fibers. 
but you can see that the soleus muscle does not cross the knee. So it's the, it's the ankle plantar flexor that is only an ankle plantar flexor and not a knee flexor. You have plantaris, which is another little tiny muscle. Um, it is also a plantar flexor. You can see that it has a very long tendon. Um, in some patient populations, this muscle doesn't even exist. It's continuous with the uh, gas rock, but it crosses the knee. And then if you were to take these muscles out, um, you would have the posterior tibialis, which is the deepest muscle of the posterior capsule. And this fills in uh, in between the tibia and the fibula, and it, uh, it comes down. And it has probably the most uh, expansive attachment into the foot. You can see that it has like six or seven attachment points. And it's, it is basically the, um, the muscle that creates the arch of the foot during supination. So the way it comes down through the medial malleoli and it shoots down and around and it, it doesn't have a better view of it. No. But it basically comes down and around the uh, medial malleoli and it, and it attaches at every single one of the uh, phalanges and at all the cuneiforms. And so it, it comes down almost like a sling and it's kind of pulling that up to create an arch into this position here like that. So it's coming down through the medial aspect and it's pulling that arch here to keep it up and supported. So a lot of the exercises that are directed towards um, to kind of helping support the arch, uh, the posterior tibialis is the muscle that gets the most attention for arch support. Then you have your toe flexor. You have, um, just like what you had with your hand, your, you had your flexor digitorum longus, and then you have a brevis, that's an intrinsic. You have flexor halicus longus, which is the big toe. Hal when you see halicus, that's referring to the first digit or the big toe or the great toe. This is numbered one, two, three, four, and five. And your fifth toe is your pinky toe. So this was categorizing them all as the posterior. So it's the flexor halicus longus. Uh, the, the interesting thing here with the flexor halicus is that it, it kind of crosses. Uh, the flexor halicus originates on the fibula, and then it crosses down, and the fibula is on the lateral side. So the origin is lateral, but the insertion is medial. And then the flexor digitorum, its origin is medial, but its uh, insertion is, is lateral. So they kind of cross over in their, uh, in their function. Both posterior, they both go through the medial aspect here, but this one comes down and straight down to the toe, whereas this one comes down and then shoots over across into the, into the digits. And you kind of see the, so here you see a better view. Here's the, um, the flexor digitorum longus, and then you can see the, um, the uh, flexor halicus longus here. And then the tibialis posterior, they're kind of showing here, but then it, it does branch into the, uh, to the arch of the foot. And they refer to this tendinous group as Tom, Dick, and Harry. So you have your uh, tibialis posterior as Tom, your flexor digitorum as dick and your flexor halicus as longus. And those are the three tendons that, that, that go right below, uh, right behind and below the medial malleoli. So Tom, Dick, and Harry is the acronym they use for that. So flexor digitorum, halicus longus, and tibialis posterior. So when we look at the anterior compartment now, uh, we don't really have a lot of musculature there. If you reach down and grab your shin right now, You'll feel uh, a bony, the, on the medial side, you'll feel your bony aspect, and that's all bone, right? A little connective tissue. And then you have this little itty bitty muscle right there, uh, which is the extensor digitorum longus, and the, the bigger of the, two, the three is the posterior, the anterior tibialis. And um, this is the primary muscle that's used in dorsiflexion. It, along with the uh, extensor digitorum, so here's your extensor digitorum longus. You can see the extensor digitorum, uh, it, uh, originates on the anterior side of the of the fibula, and you can see that the the, uh, the tibialis posterior kind of covers that up. So this is the most superficial muscle, and then right below, right by side, so you have the extensor digitorum and the extensor halicus. So you have your toe extensors, and you have your um, extensor your tibialis anterior, and that's it. Those are the only two muscles combining these two together. And what happens is that when you, if you feel the front of your leg, you feel this little itty bitty muscle group, and then you turn around and you feel the back of your leg, and your back of your leg is like significantly meatier than the front of your leg. 
And this comes up in the future when we talk about loading of the feet. Um, when you do a lot of heel strike or traditional running, the uh, ankle hits the ground first, and then you have to decelerate plantar flexion. And it's these muscles here of the anterior compartment that are the muscles that are responsible for that eccentric loading. So tibialis anterior, extensor hallucis longus, and extensor digitorum longus. And if you look at the total cross-sectional of these muscles, it's virtually nothing. When you look at the posterior uh, muscles, you can see that there's just, you can feel it's a huge ton of them. And what's not re, uh, depicted here is soleus and gastroc, which are even bigger. And when you do, when you do four foot loading, you're decelerating plantar flexion and you are, um, those muscles are taking on more of that responsibility. So this gets in the conversation later when we talk about four foot versus rear foot strike, a uh, distance running versus sprinting, that the more muscle you have to absorb that stress, the less connective tissue damage you have and um, you get conditions like shin splints, which is an anterior compartment syndrome, which is basically nothing more than these muscles being overworked, irritated, inflamed, and not able to handle the loads that are being exposed to them. So a lot of these chronic issues like plantar fasciitis, uh, anterior compartment syndrome, and then you, it, it goes up the, connective, connective, uh, kinetic, uh, the kinetic chain. You have your arch collapse and failure first, then you have your, um, your uh, anterior compartment or shin splints. And then the next line of force to control pronation is through the IT band. So you get your IT band syndrome. That's uh, inappropriate controlling of internal rotation of the hip that puts stress through the back for the external rotators. And you get your piriformis type syndrome up into the back and then whatever else up the chain. So you can see that this whole collapsing with gravity, this pronation, the arch, the internal rotation, the uh, dorsiflexion, internal rotation of the hip, it's all same continuous. It's the same thing, just where is the weakest link in the chain? Someone that has IT band issues, their weak link was the IT band. Someone that has uh, anterior compartment syndrome, their weak link was the anterior tibialis. Someone that has plantar fasciitis, their weak link was a plantar fasciitis. It was the same stress, same movement that brought it on. It's just that there was breakdown at one of those three points. Then you have your lateral compartment, and these make up the peroneal muscles, and you have a peroneus longus, brevis, and tertius. So you have your longus, which is the bulk of the muscle, then you have your, uh, and these are sometimes referred to as fibularis. Uh, those aren't them. Hold on a second. Here they are. Here's your peroneus brevis. You have a longus up top and tertius. And all of these muscles, they come down and hit on the lateral side, and they hit that, that protrusion, that tubercle of that fifth metatarsal. And these are the muscles that are involved in eversion and abduction. And in fact, if you try to like evert your foot or turn your foot out, you'll feel those uh, peroneal muscles kick in for, uh, for a particular aspect. And I think that's it for all of your uh, extrinsic muscles. So a lot easier to navigate than the, the arm. Yeah, so they don't even go through your... And they do, they just kind of bump the, um, the intrinsic muscles together. So you have your uh, extensor digitorum um, and your flexor digitorum brevis. So you have these smaller muscles that do flexion extension, just like you had with your hands. And then you have a bunch of um, deeper uh, third layer, like your quadratus, your lumber lumbricals and muscles to kind of help support the lateral movements, this ab and abduction. And don't think of ab and abduction like you would your fingers. Think of ab and abduction as like spreading the arch and collapsing the arch. That's really what these muscles are doing, these, uh, these quadratus muscles, these lumbricals. Um, you do get some adduction, but it's more of the, all these muscles here are basically caving in the arch or flattening out the arch, right? That's, that's what a lot of these uh, intrinsic muscles are doing. I don't know if I would really worry about the origin insertion of all these. It doesn't look like the textbook is going into a lot of detail but I would focus in on the fact that they are involved in arch support and then being able to delineate between intrinsic and extrinsic. Like ex extrinsic have its origination above, uh, outside the foot and intrinsic on the inside. But the, um, you know, the extrinsic muscles, I think there's only about eight of them. And you can kind of see them here. You have your gastroc and your soleus. And then when you reflect that back, you've got your plantaris. And then you have your popliteus, which we learned about from the knee, but it's just here along with the, tib, the posterior tib. You have your flexor digitorum longus, your flexor hallucis longus, and then your three peroneal muscles. So it's a little easier to kind of appreciate those muscles uh, and see them better.
you can see the plantar fascia cut and you can see, like I said, that what, what was filled in there is you can see the, uh, the flexor digitorum. And as you take those muscles out, you can see the lumbricals and the quadratus plantae. And again, you can see kind of their force line, how they're reinforcing each other and they're really involved in that, uh, that arch of the foot. I think that's it. I have an article somewhere. Just let me just see if I can find it without having to look for it. Oh, there it is. So this is a really cool article by the British Journal of Sports Medicine. Let me see if we can have access to it. I think it's an open access article. Perfect. So if you just do uh, a search on core of the foot, um, it's a great article. It gets, it, it actually has really great images. The reason I found this a long time ago is because I was, I, I liked the images that it had for the, the intrinsic foot musculature. And it, it has a really cool view. And you, if you, if you watch the videos already, you'll see that it, I, I, I used all these images, but it kind of shows the arch, right? You have your transverse arch and then you have your lateral and medial longitudinal arches, but it, it kind of, it, it visually depicts the arches of the foot as a dome more as a bowl more than as a singular arch and then it kind of shows the plantar fascia it can it shows the achilles tendon relationship with the plantar fascia you can kind of see how that oops all right stop all right, you can kind of see how it wraps around and, and it's continuous and that loading from extrinsic fat uh, forces can change the length of this arch and then you have your other uh, ligaments that make up the arch support. And then it starts to get into the foot musculature. The, the, this is showing the extrinsic musculature. And now these, even though this looks like connected tissue, these are nothing more than the tendons. So here's your, here's your flexor digitorum longus coming all the way down and around. And here is the, um, the, the posterior tibialis. And you can see how robust that uh, attachment is. It just fans in and touch, it attaches to everything uh, underneath the foot. So all of the heads of the phalanges. It's all the tarsals and it comes down and around the outside here. And so that's why it gets most of its attention when it looks at the ex extrinsic muscles for uh, arch support. And then it has the layers of the um, intrinsic muscles and you can see how it layers in, how they all kind of anchor here at the at calcaneus and they're shooting up to pull the forefoot, the distal end of the, for the, distal end of the forefoot to the proximal end of the rear foot. And when I take that end and this end and I pull together, it, it creates that arch, that dome. And so it's, it's that length tension relationship between here and here. Let me see if we go back to the plantar fascia. So if this, and if this is the direction of movement that foot happens, you can appreciate how that tissue is going to be pissed off and irritated. And what all the muscles are doing in the, in the foot here, those intrinsics is they're taking that end and pulling it this way. And they're taking that end and pulling it that way. And they're resisting that collapsing force when it's coming down. And as long as the muscles are, are taking that brunt, this plantar fascia is perfectly happy and fine. It's when the muscles are too are overworked, that plantar fascia starts to get overworked. And that's when you start to get that, that tearing, that ripping, that inflammation, that non-healing aspect. And it's not just the intrinsic muscles, it's also the muscles that are coming down and around that are also pulling on that. So sorry to sound like a broken record, but hopefully that, uh, that makes sense. That's a great article. It's got great images. I think that's it for the images, but it uh, it it kind of talks about some of the exercises. You can see the relaxed foot, the short arc or short foot maneuver, where you're trying to basically bring this end closer to this. But you can see that it's not about the toe flexion. It's about bringing the ball of the foot back towards the heel, not bringing the toe in towards the heel. So it's a great article. It's like a like a semester of foot mechanics in, in one article. And the images themselves were just fantastic for, uh, for display. And we can appreciate how important the core is the spine. This is the same, this is the core of the foot, the ability to maintain that arch and go through pronation and supination when you're appropriately doing that. What year was this article? This was 2013, so it's yeah, so seven years is still pretty good. Any questions?
So I'm going to download this article and I'll, I'll post it to the Blackboard shell. I think I have it in my K. It, it might already be there, as a matter of fact, now that I think about it. 